There we go. Hello and welcome everyone to the uh, hello and welcome to the um, latest of the Stormwater 360 webinar series for 2023. It's my great pleasure again to be joined by Kevin here. And uh, as we take a look into the storm filter, the webinar today is lifting the hood on the storm filter. Um, deep dive into the storm filter about the product, its history, how it performs, how it's designed, how you can design it into your project, and a little bit about the operations and maintenance of the device. Throughout this presentation, if you have any questions at all, please do put them into the chat function. Uh, so if you use the chat function, and then what we'll do is at the end of the presentation, uh, we can go through and answer some of those questions there. So uh, hopefully you can all hear us. Someone put that in the chat that you can hear us. Um, and then we can make, make a start. So I'm Matthew Howes. I'm in the sales team. Uh, recently uh, become a green infrastructure specialist with Stormwater 360, which is uh, really exciting. Nature-based solutions and nature-based design is a big focus on that at the moment. Um, but it's absolutely key that we all understand all of the technologies that we offer. And we have a lot of experience with the storm filter. And Kevin is our senior engineer, technical. Yep. Um, and has been with the company now for 13, 13 years. years. Yeah. So has an awful lot of experience with designing and implementing the storm filter as a product. Stormwater 360 is unique in terms of a supply company in that we have, I think, more engineers within the company than salespeople. We really want to make sure that we're offering a great product uh, and great outcomes for your project. So a little bit of an overview for the webinar. We will introduce uh, the storm filter and introduce a little bit about where the storm filter sits as a manufactured treatment device. We'll look at uh, the storm filter and how it fits within best management practices and best practicable options. What those two terms mean and what needs to be considered when you're choosing a either a BPO or a BMP. We'll look at how the storm filter works, deep, a little bit of a dive into the design of the storm filter. Um, but throughout all of that, just re remember that we did a couple of webinars, um, both last year and this year, on the hydraulics of manufactured treatment devices. So I can really encourage you all to go and look at the hydraulics webinars because that covers a lot of the hydraulics details in with um, designing the storm filter. We'll then look at the maintenance, inspection and warranty process with the storm filter as well. So some vital statistics about the storm filter in New Zealand. In New Zealand, up until now, there are at least 2,850 storm filters. And within each of those storm filters, there's a total of nearly 17,000 storm filter cartridges. And that's just within New Zealand alone. Those storm filters, every time it rains, like it's doing today in Auckland and elsewhere throughout the country, we treat a total of 20,550 litres per second. And that's just the water quality flow rate every time it rains. Elsewhere in the world, uh, the United States since 2009 has over 15,000 storm, storm filters uh, that have been installed. There's many thousands then in Australia, Italy, and there's at least 50,000 systems worldwide. It is the world's most widely used and adopted manufactured treatment device. And for good reason, as you'll find out. So a little bit of a timeline then of both stormwater treatment, the storm filter and stormwater 360. So we've been managing water quantity for thousands of years. The Romans were pretty good at getting water to where they wanted it to go. But the first water quality guideline in the world was the 1986 Clean Water Act released in the USA. In New Zealand, TP10 was the first water quality regulation domestically, and that was released in 1992. 
Stormwater 360 was founded then in by Mike Hanna and Greg Yeoman, who are within the company still as directors. That was founded in 1996. So we've been at the forefront of understanding stormwater treatment ever since. In New Zealand, we introduced the storm filter and got the first uh, Auckland, uh, then Auckland Regional Council approval for the storm filter in 2003. And by 2019, we've installed over 2000 storm filters just in New Zealand. So we have an awful lot of experience, both in terms of time frame and uh, number of devices. How does that fit in with the storm filter? Well, the storm filter was invented and had its first, um, first product approval in the States in 1997. So the storm filter sits in, again, very early on in the process of manufactured treatment devices. So why, why do we sell the storm filter? What does the storm filter really achieve? This is a photo from inside a storm filter on a very highly trafficked road. And without any form of stormwater treatment device, all of that would flow straight out to, in this case, the Waitemata Harbour. So the storm filter acts as a device that stops pollution getting into the receiving environment. So what does it treat? What are we treating when we treat stormwater? And by and large, we categorize the contaminants that we have to treat. And from the categorization of those contaminants, that tells us the type of treatment we need to do and the type of treatment device we might need to do. There are a range of contaminants and it depends on your site as to what you might see. There are oils and hydrocarbons. There's litter, which is generally greater than, uh, which is greater than five mil. There's coarse sediment. Coarse sediment is anywhere from 110 micron up to 250 micron. So that's kind of 0.1 millimeters and up. Then there's fine sediment. Fine sediment can range anywhere from that 110 micron down to as little as two micron if you're dealing with a lot of clay soil, for example. And then you have metals and nutrients. Metals and nutrients can either be in particulate form or dissolved form. And you have to consider what speciation they're in when you're designing treatment for them. So for each of these types of contaminants, there is a range of generally desirable treatment outcomes. So for litter is 100% trash capture. Coarse sediment is pretreatment and internationally uh, is generally 50% TSS removal, but there's no local standard. In New Zealand, we operate on 75% TSS removal for fine sediment. Internationally, the global standard is 80% TSS removal. And then for metals and nutrients, again, there's no local standard, uh, but generally we seek to use biofiltration. So for each type of contaminant and for each removal outcome, there are a range of manufactured treatment devices that are available and that Stormwater 360 offer to target that type of contaminant. And the reason why we have a range of devices is not every device is going to be best suitable to the particular site conditions here. So today we're focusing on the storm filter, but it's really important to know, although the storm filter is primarily designed to remove fine sediment, it also removes coarse sediment, trash, captures some oils and can be used for metal and nutrient removal as well. So although the storm filter often gets pigeonholed into just being a sediment removal device, it works across the board for all of the types of stormwater contaminants that we're dealing with in New Zealand. So a question then is, how does the storm filter fit in in terms of, you know, there are nature based solutions, should we use wetlands, should we use rain gardens? Nature-based design is always a good choice, and it's something that I'm finding more and more about uh, the more I learn about uh, my new role um, as a green infrastructure specialist. There's more benefits than just treatment using nature-based design. You get habitat creation, you get green space, there's, there's all of these benefits, but it's not always practicable for your site. Manufactured treatment devices provide consistent proven outcomes with a fraction of the footprint and often with some operational benefits as well. 
And depending on the type of treatment device that you um, choose, you can target a range of contaminants, either as a standalone system or part of a treatment train. So you can see in here, here we have a uh, stormwater wetland, and here is a uh, manufactured treatment device, and all you see is just the cover there. So again, space saving benefits there. So the storm filter, arguably the best BPO treatment device available on the market. But what does that mean? BMP, BPO, nature-based versus manufactured? Well, the best management practice is what is the best possible outcome? This definition on the top here is from uh, United States stormwater guideline, and it means it's what is the most effective and practical means of preventing or reducing pollution discharge into the environment. That, though, is not always practicable. It might have footprint constraints. There might be level constraints. There might be cost constraints. And that's where we have the idea of the best practicable option, BPO. And this definition here is from the RMA, a very wordy document. Um, and there are lots of definitions that are used um, throughout the both the country uh, and overseas. But it's really important that is the BPO is the what is the best method that has regard for both the outcomes, the financial and cost implications alongside the effects of the environment, and how successfully that option will work and be able to be applied. So although the B, although the RMA has a quite a wordy definition of BPO, it's also mentioned in for example, the Christchurch, Auckland and Wakakatahi stormwater treatment design standards. So for the storm filter as a BPO, we have to trade off the performance of the device versus the total cost of the device and then the operation and maintenance burden of that device. We could chuck stormwater runoff through a coffee filter paper and we'd get very, very high percentage removal of TSS. But would that then need an unreasonable amount of maintenance, meaning it is not the best practicable option? The, B, uh, the BPO needs to function and operate well, but again, not at the cost of the outcomes. So we have to achieve good performance, but also the device needs to be able to operate over a long period. And the storm filter has desi been designed with all of this in mind. So Kevin, a little bit about how the storm filter then works. Yes, thank you very much for that, Matt. So the storm filter, it is basically a um, siphon activated cartridges, which is filled with media. It is versatile and you can scale it from one cartridge system that you may be um, installed in a car park or in a singular uh, house um, road to a subdivision or you can scale it up to a 300 cartridge or our biggest system is roughly about 500 cartridges treating you know 100 hectares of catchment. Um, the cartridges has different range of driving heat um, from a large to a smaller driving range down to 350 mil, where uh, we can use it for a site with a hydraulic restriction. And as Matt said before, the system can target um, different contaminants using different media to target sediment, um, oil and grease, heavy metals, whether it's particulate or, or dissolved, organics and nutrients. So getting to how it how the device itself actually works. As you can see here, this is a would be a concrete base in a manhole or a vault or sort. And this is the pipe underneath the cartridges where the treated water will discharge to. And this is a cross-sectional view of the storm for the cartridge itself. Notice the red float here that is actually blocking the outlet at this point. So at the moment, um, when the rainfall event actually starts, it will fill up the vault. And you can see um, the water level will rise up. And as you can see, the air will get purged outside um, from the cartridges itself. 
And once the water level reaches the shoulder of the cartridges, then what will happen is the float will pop open. And at that point, the siphon actually gets activated. All the contaminated water will have to go through the media, and that's where all the media will do its treatment mechanism to remove the contaminants. Once it goes through the media, it will go into the center column, and the treated water will go through into the pipe below. This will keep going um, throughout the rainfall event, and when it finishes, you can see that the water will start draining through the vault. But as you can notice here, the water level inside the actual hood itself will stay high on the shoulder. That's because there is a one-way air cap, airway cap at the top that essentially stops any air bubble getting introduced. So it actually creates a suction. So when the water level gets to the bottom of the hood, what will happen is air then gets introduced. What will happen, it actually will shake the cartridge hood itself and that will dislodge some, um, the contaminant from inside of the hood and from off from the storm filter cartridges. Once the water level um, finish inside the vault, that's when the float will return back to its original position. So this is a video of what I just explained to you and it will happen pretty quickly in a few seconds. Hopefully I can explain this quickly enough while the video is working. So the water is, um, is coming up, and you can see at this point the float will pop. And while it's getting treated, you can see the water outside the cartridges itself drain, while the inside, the water level still remains high. Once the water gets to the bottom of the hood, that's when the air gets introduced. This is when it starts shaking, and it dislodges all the contaminant inside the, um, the cartridges itself. And that's basically how the storm filter cartridge work, simple enough. So this is a um, TSS performance curve of the storm filter when it was getting tested, when, when it's going through the approval process at Washington. Now, in Washington, the, um, it's a little bit different compared to here. They generally target 80% um, TSS removal when the influent concentration is between 100 to 200 milligram per liter. And once it's, the influent concentration gets higher than 200 milligram, generally they will discard that because all treatment devices tend to actually have a much higher um, percentage removal when it gets um, high influent concentration. As you can see here, the storm filter, when it gets um, higher than 200 milligram per liter, you see the percentage removals um, at the 95, sometimes even at the 98%. Percent, uh, percent. But when the, info, um, when the water coming in is clean and there isn't much sediment at all, the treatment system wouldn't be able to um, provide that 80% TSS removal. So what Washington does is when it's below 100 milligram per liter, they want the system to generally get um, an effluent quality of 20 milligram per liter. And it can be shown on this part here where um, the influent is very low. And when it starts climbing up towards the 100 milligram per liter, you can see the average um, percentage removal gets starting to get closer to the 80%. So be careful when someone says uh, a flat um, number on percentage removal on their devices, because the influent concentration can affect the, um, the performance immensely. This is another um, performance testing that we that has been done on the storm filter using a zeolite media. And as you can see, when the influent dissolves in concentration is is quite high, it tends to show the, um, the zinc removal up to 90, 93%. So some of the, we'll go through some of the treatment mechanism. Um, as I said, that uh, there's the media inside the filter cartridges themselves. And the treatment mechanism basically goes through a physical filtration removal, um, a cation exchange, um, and also at absorption and absorption um, through the filter media itself. 
So we um, the storm filter basically is a container, so we can use all sorts of different media inside it to target different contaminant of concern. So if it goes through um, a different an industrial place or any um, site with a different um, contaminant that we need to target to talk to us. There's different range of media that we could use. Some of the common one we would use is perlite, where it, we where it targets sediment or a lot of the uh, particulate contaminants, also with oil and grease nutrients. Um, another media would be um, a zeolite, which typically we use to target um, the dissolved metal nutrients and carbon we we also would use for soluble um, with dissolved metal and organ organics as well. But do talk to us because there's definitely other media that um, they are available like phosphorzorb or um, Rx media. Oops. So we'll just go through um, the perlite, which is what we commonly use all over New, New Zealand. It is a um, it is an expanded volcanic ash, and because it got expanded, it becomes a very porous um, media, and it has a lot of um, opening inside it. But it is also, if you look closely on this picture here, it is uh, has sharp edges, so it can capture a lot of the sediment when water is going through it. It is slightly different how it works compared to a sand, which is a surface filter. A sand, a sand filter will capture the um, contaminants through the spacing in, in between the surface of the, each granule, granular. But for a depth filter like the perlite, it allows the, the sediment to go through and it gets captured within um, the perlite itself. So a surface filter will end up getting clogged at the top. And what you'll see is the bottom part or the inner depth of the filter ended up being clean and not getting used at all. While the depth filter like perlite will, you'll see that um, it will use the full depth of the media. Now zeolite is a naturally occurring rock. There's also porous. And it is commonly used for um, a treatment uh, media. It is slightly different that it can also has a physical removal of contaminant, but it also has a cation exchange um, chemical reaction. What it is is when water flows through the zeolite, some of the ion with a weaker bond will detach from the zeolite itself, making the um, the surface negative negatively charged. And when the dissolved metal, which is the positively charged contaminant, flows through the zeolite, it gets captured like a magnetic um, reaction. So this is where oh. it, this is where it gets interesting, and we uh, stop our screen sharing. So you should now be able to see us really clearly. And the storm filter itself is that a lot of the treatment is done by the media, but we need a mechanism to hold that media, and that's where the cartridge comes into play. So these are two different different height storm filter cartridges. So Kevin, Kevin said at the beginning that there is there are a range of heights of cartridges. This is a 69 centimeter cartridge, and this is a 46 centimeter cartridge, and that allows us to provide treatment on sites that may have um, restrictions for um, the hydraulics. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, if we start at the top of the cartridge, is the one-way air valve. So this is screws, and uh, this is what uh, allows the air to only go out as the device is filling up. So air comes out, uh, up through here, but can't get, can't get back in once the siphon is broken. Then we have the hood. And now what's really important here is that during maintenance, you want to inspect the media, you want to look at the media. And to look at the media, you simply have to unscrew the hood, unscrew that cap, lift off the hood. So these are the hoods of the cartridges. And then we have the cartridge in here. This cartridge is full with perlite media, you can see here. It's like a light white color. 
And this cartridge is empty, so you can see what's inside this cartridge. So then inside the 69 centimeter cartridge, we have the center column, which contains the float. So that float then sits in there, and then there is a netting that, um, mesh that sits in. And what the mesh does, again, it's to our specification, and that allows contaminants to filter into the media, but doesn't then allow anything to filter through into the central column and get flushed out. What the cartridge then sits on is this here. This is a spigot that sits into the base of the storm filter, either the false floor or the um, aluminium deck. And there's a quarter turn here. So simply all you have to do to unscrew the cartridge is a quarter turn. Much like if anyone's got a, a Garmin or something that they put on their bike, it's just a simple quarter turn that sits in there. And then underneath the spigot, you can see here there is a restrictor disc and the restrictor disc helps manage the flows through the treatment device. And then simply once you've done, say, inspecting your media, all you do is you put the hood back on. Screw on the top cap. And away you go. So it's really, really important that it's easy to inspect the cartridges and inspect the media uh, and excuse me, by by being able to inspect the uh, cartridge and the media without um, without having to take off the cartridge from the spigot, that makes life that makes life a lot easier. So what about then the, the, the fundamentals of the water flow and how does the water fil filter through the media? Well, water could either flow vertically or horizontally through a uh, media and through a cartridge. And the storm filter is unique in having a siphonic radial water flow. So it uses a siphon to equally distribute the water flowing horizontally, radially, through the cartridge. So what does this do? It means we have equal both uh, water pressure and water load and sediment load across the height of the cartridge. It increases the um, sediment load before blinding because we use the uh, outside of the cartridge, not the base of the cartridge um, for, for the uh, media. That increases the interval between maintenances. And then that increases the ratio of the surface area to volume. So for the same volume of media, then there is a higher, larger surface area. So what about the media contact time? For things like metal removal, where you have um, um, chemical interactions going on, the contact time is really important. But that's the same as well for TSS removal. And we found in testing that reducing the flow rate to half, even with perlite, gives us an extra 10 to 15% TSS removal. That is, uh, that is achieved by having an increased residence time within the media. That promotes uh, micro settling of sediment within the media, and we get finer particles as a result. And as I said, increased contact time is better for dissolved contaminants as well. And as you saw, we adjust the contact time and the flow through the cartridges using a restrictor disc. So without any form of flow controls, the 69 centimeter cartridge with perlite can flow at over five liters per second. As a general rule of thumb, we designed at about uh, 1.4 litres per second per cartridge. So why do we throttle back the ultimate flow of the device? We adjust the flow rate for the performance, for the treatment outcomes, because the increased contact time gives a higher TSS removal. <clears throat> it also means we need more cartridges. So there's a larger surface area for the same amount of sediment going to the device which means the device will clog less quickly. All treatment devices should have a suitable safety factor. And the safety factor on the storm filter is about five. We manage that with the restrictor discs. 
Brain gardens, for example, have a built in safety factor of two. And there'll be a presentation coming up soon that talks about safety factors in treatment devices. So all of that, all of the management of the storm filter and the flows through the device is because we need to design the storm filter as a BPO. And it, when we design it, it needs to trade off the performance. It needs to capture contaminants. But it needs to do it in a way that is economical to procure and install. But in a way is such that the maintenance requirements are not going to be onerous. This storm filter on the right here, if if we designed a storm filter that looked like that after only three months, I don't think many people would want to do the maintenance on that to that extent for every three months. So it is that operational side of the storm filter where a lot of our knowledge and a lot of our research has sat to make the device practical for uh, for our clients to use. So um, as Matt said before, a treatment device needs longevity um, before it needs to be maintained. And it is basically the length of time or the amount of sediment it can handle while it's operating at its design flow rate. Once it gets below that, it will need, that means it's time for maintenance to be done. Now, there are a couple of things that we, um, all treatment devices you typically look at, either the surface loading um, on the cartridges or whatever, um, um, whatever they use for the treatment mechanism through the media and how much the sediment is in the sump itself. And just that photo there, you can just see the top caps <laughs> sitting in, sitting in there. So that uh, storm filters well and That's truly good. ready for maintenance. <laughs> so for the media surface, as Matt said before, typically for a treatment system, you either flow through the media from vertically or horizontally. A vertical treatment system is typically like a sand filter system or some of the um, upflowing uh, treatment system as well. Now, if you look through the um, cartridges themselves here, um, as you can see, the uh, it is unique that storm filter flows through horizontally. And that means um, from the cartridges, as you can see, there's a large surface area, um, which means can, for the same treatment flow rate, um, it will low, lower the hy hydraulic loading. It spreads the sediment um, on a larger through the larger area, and that means it has a much lower risk too for it to get clogged, and it also will increase the maintenance interval as well. One of the photo here is a storm filter system that we tested without having the hood, and that blinded the surface. Having that hood and having that. Um, air bubble getting introduced at the end of the rainfall event, shakes that off and keeps it um, free from getting occluded um, from the sediment. The mess loading um, is another thing that we need to consider. Um, as you can see here on the photo, uh, the, the media here does get used up uh, um, throughout the full depth rather than some of some filter will get clogged right at the front part of it. And it is part of part of it because the perlite property as well that it, um, it captures um, and allows it to use the full depth of the media. Now each cartridge usually has about 100 to 100, um, 150 liter of media, depending on which size cartridges you would use and it will capture up to 25 kilogram of five fine sediment before it starts dropping the design below its design flow. How do we know this? We did a lot of mass loading tests um, on the storm filter system. What we did is we took some of the fine sediment that has settled down at a wetland and we slowly um, introduce it into the storm filter cartridge throughout the flow, and we keep putting more and more of the sediment until it actually drops below its design flow rate. So the system has gone through a lot of 
mass loading, uh, testing with um, fine sediment to make sure that we know how much it can handle. Mm -hmm. And you can see, uh, you can see here as well. This is the this is the sediment that sits below the hood, and then this is the sediment where the bubbles have agitated. So it really does provide that self cleaning process as it drains down. So we've done a lot of R and D to have a product that and a storm filter that we know works really well, both and provides great treatment outcomes, but has uh, really good longevity. So how do you then design that? How do we design that into a project? So designing stormwater treatment and designing with manufactured treatment devices is not something that is typically talked about a lot in various stormwater management guidelines. A lot of the time they tell you how to size a rain garden, how to size a wetland, but they don't speak to how to size a manufactured treatment device the pros and cons of the different treatment mechanisms, the hydraulic impacts on the network that that treatment device might have. Hydraulics matters within product approvals and is included in uh, Auc the Auckland approval um, processes. So it's really important that you consider all of these factors when you're designing in a storm filter into your network. So if you come to us, we'll ask you, what are the treatment requirements? Is it just sediment? Do you have any dissolved metals to consider? Because that affects the type of media that we might use and the flow rate that we might look to use. We'll ask you what the catchment areas are and both the water quality and any other flow rates to the device. That helps us work out how many cartridges we might need with what type of media. We'll ask you what the available depth to invert is of the inlet and the outlet, and that will help tell us how much space for the device we have. We'll ask, we'll ask if there are any driving head constraints, and if there's any downstream water levels, say from a detention tank or a swale, that we need to, to consider to make sure there's no tail water acting on the device. We can advise you how our devices will integrate into your network, so it's really important that you do reach out to us during that design phase. And there's more information on this in that hydraulics webinar. But with everything with the storm filter, we start at the cartridges first, not the manhole size, we start with the cartridges. So the design starts and we, we look and we go, right, so what's the water quality flow rate? Are there any hydraulic limitations that mean we need to use 46 centimeter cartridges as opposed to 69? And is there an increased sediment mass load that means we need to increase the number of cartridges so the maintenance isn't overly onerous? All of that is factored into the design of a storm filter, and all of that feeds into how many cartridges we might need to choose. So I know, we, I know we've said that there's an excellent hydraulics webinar, but if you think back to um, what we looked at when we looked at the storm filter itself and the storm filter cartridge, there are lots of places within the storm filter where there are individual losses through the system. So we have a range of driving head options, 930 millimeters for, the, for our volts, 770 millimetres down to 380 millimetres, depending on the cartridge height within manholes. But those are head losses that account for all of the losses through the system. They include the depth of flow in the outlet pipe. They include the losses of the restricted disc and the under drain and the cartridge. There is a lot more to, to understanding the actual head losses through the system than just uh, just What's the driving head needed for the float to pop? So as a result, because we know this intimately, we can manipulate the design of the storm filter, depending on if you have different contaminants, whether there's increased sediment loads from industrial sites or state highways, whether there's any safety in design or maintenance interval requirements. So it's a really, really flexible product as a result. So we can go from our smallest devices single cartridge in a 1050 manhole, which is on the left, 
And on the right is a drawing of the um, device Kevin mentioned that's got about 570 cartridges in. And to give you an idea of scale, that little orange circle is to scale, showing there's a huge range, a huge range here that's available. All you have to think about is what size device do we need? We'll consider the flow distribution, the maintenance, all of that when we do our design for your system. So as a result, there's a few options that you can house storm filter cartridges in. A lot of people kind of start with the housing, whereas we like to start with the cartridges and the number of cartridges. So as uh, you'll be pretty used to seeing the manhole storm filters, here they are leaving our yard and that guy has some wonderfully short shorts on there. Um, we have precast concrete vaults. The idea behind both the manholes and the precast concrete vaults is that they're plug and play solutions. They turn up to site, drop them in, connect up the pipe, and then away you go. For larger storm filters, we might do some built in situ vaults. This one here is in uh, McLaughlin's Road down in Wirree. Um, built in situ allows for flexibility, allows for bay design a lot uh, for larger cartridges. We could have storm filters that use swales for pretreatment and flow distribution. This is sitting on the northern motorway and this storm filter, bearing in mind it's treating runoff from a motorway, has a maintenance interval of about five years. So that's five years before you have to go and change the cartridges because there is swale as a pretreatment. Or the manhole can sit either partially above ground. We've even done designs for storm filters inside custom housing and floating pontoons. So the storm filter itself, very flexible in where you might choose to put it. So once the storm filter is in the ground, it then has to operate. That's the, the third principle, um, third part of the BPO is treatment, cost, and then operations. So why should you maintain your storm filter? Well, proprietary and manufactured treatment devices will only perform as designed if they're maintained. So to get the outcomes that you need for the environment, the treatment device has to be maintained. Regular maintenance will guarantee the treatment and regular maintenance will uh, reduce the number of corrective and potential rebuild type maintenances that you need, therefore lowering the total life cycle cost of the treatment device. If we take within Auckland, for example, a thousand meter squared catchment area, Within Auckland, a thousand meters squared can be treated by two 69 centimeter cartridges in a 1200 manhole. To use a, a green solution, the comparable rain garden for that area is 20 meters squared. So not only is there a footprint benefit, but also it's a lot easier to go in and maintain a small manhole than say 20 meters squared footprint rain garden. The alternative of course, is to use one of our Filtera, which is even better again. Regular inspection and maintain is important, and then you maintain as required. And that's really key, is that you don't maintain regularly, you inspect regularly, and then maintain when it's needed. So there's a few things that we look out for uh, when we're doing uh, maintenance inspection. We look at the surrounds of the storm filter to see if there's good access. We look at the accumulated sediment depth, the condition of the media. That's why it's so important that it's easy to lift the hood and check the status of the media. We look and see whether there's any oils and grease and standing water in the device. If any of those are up to a certain level, that triggers us with a maintenance. So again, it's really important. You only maintain once inspection has verified you need maintenance. And that's important because we can't guarantee the length of time between maintenances. Typically, we design to 18 months. I've seen storm filters that need maintaining every six months. I've seen storm filters that have gone for five years and then need a maintenance. You can never guarantee a minimum maintenance interval. It's impossible. Every site is different. So it's really important that you go and take a look at it and see if it needs maintaining. The maintenance of a storm filter involves removing the cartridges, cleaning out the vault, 
then operating cartridge exchange where the maintenance contractor gets replacement cartridges from us and then they dispose of the media and the water and the sediment um, properly. Then maintenance port reports can be provided to the asset owner uh, and for compliance monitoring with councils. Maintenance of storm filters is done by a uh, third party, by third party providers, not by Stormwater 360 ourselves. And we therefore require contractors to undertake a training course. And that means that across the country, there's national coverage for maintenance, but it is robustly organized with an equal platform so wherever you are in the country, whoever's doing the work, I'll be able to do the work for you, have equitable access to the cartridges and pricing, and there's good quality assurance then that using a Stormwater 360 um, approved uh, maintenance contractor will have good ongoing outcomes. It's also important because we operate a lifetime warranty on the maintenance of on the on, for the Stormfielder cartridges. So you, by using the cartridge exchange program with an approved contractor, they send back the cartridges to us. We then refurbish them, refill them, and are able to use them again in uh, other, other devices. That lowers our environmental footprint uh, and helps bring the cost down for the owners uh, and asset owners of the devices. So, that's a little bit of an overview of the storm filter. We've looked at the storm filter, how it sits within treatment devices and other treatment devices. We've looked at what a best uh, practicable option is versus a best management practice and what we have to consider when we're designing the storm filter. We've looked at how the storm filter works. We've looked at how we design storm filters and how you would look to design a storm filter into your project. And we've looked at the maintenance, inspections and warranty process. So if there are any questions, please do put those in the chat function and we'll look to answer those now. So great question here from um, Lee Dang. For Green Star projects, do you offer music modeling of storm filters to claim Green Star points? Green Star is an interesting one. I've had a few conversations with uh, consultants recently on Green Star. Green Star, if you're already achieving the point for volume reduction, then you are eligible to look at the point for water quality. Now, with everything, Green Star only asks for percentage removal of certain contaminants but, uh, over and above the um, typical annual load um, runoff from the runoff from that type of site. So as Kevin said when he you know, look, was looking at the TSS and with the metals is if you have very high concentrations into the storm filter then we would expect very high percentage removal of that particular contaminant but the likes of say metals for a lot of green star projects we might not expect that high loads of metals both of dissolved and particulate um, into the storm filter especially important because metals i believe now is dissolved yep. um, yeah for yeah. for that so part of the question then is are we going to be able to achieve very high percentage removals of metals using storm filter if there's very low influent concentration and that's kind of hard to hard to guarantee yeah um that's a pretty long <laughs> pretty <laughs> long answer <laughs> to a short question but yeah i think it is something that we're currently discussing with the green uh star people um yep. to to actually see if if what they're actually asking is achievable or not and at currently um, we haven't really been doing any music modeling to provide for the project but um, it is something that we probably can work with the green star people once um, we're actually looking at something more realistic or yep. um, and as well lee the the model doesn't have to be a music model i've seen green star uh, models done using um excel the uh, an adapted version of the auckland council contaminant load model and that 
percentage reduction of contaminants doesn't solely have to be done by the storm filter. Mm. You could implement site control practices. You could sweep the site to before it rains. You could use a certain type of um, um, certain type of uh, fertilizer in the planting areas. You could pick up the grass clippings instead of leave them out to mulch to help reduce the nutrient load. There's a lot of ways beyond just the storm filter that you can motivate for green star points for stormwater outcomes. But that's something that we can certainly help with to help with there. So um, Chris has then asked a, a really good question. Can you speak more to tailwater effects on the filter system? Are reverse flows possible given uh, with the float arrangement? Um, it's definitely something that we do not recommend to have a tailwater effect on the filter system itself. Um, it can handle it, certainly, but what happens is during a tailwater effect, what it does, it, it reduces the available driving heat um, because then the water coming in from the positive effect gets, uh, some of it gets displaced by the tailwater effect from downstream. Um, there's a little bit more detail on that if you look through our um, hydraulic webinar, yep. um, which Matthew has mentioned, we did that last year. I think it's available on the website. Um, but yeah, we generally don't recommend um, that, but it definitely can handle it. But you, what we usually recommend is putting in a one way valve for, um, if there's a tailwater effect. But we can talk to you about, uh, about that, Chris, unless you're trying to do a tailwater effect and trying to treat it from um, coming from downstream. Um, that's a, quite a bit of different yeah, um, discussion. <laughs> And Morales asked a really good question, actually, on pre-treatment and pre-treatment for, uh, in this case, storm yep. filters. But um, I think these questions would ring true for pre-treatment for any treatment device. So the questions are, how do different GPTs help with maintenance frequency of storm filters? And then does designing pre-treatment before the storm filter help optimise or reduce the number of cartridges needed? So let's start with that one first, Kevin. Does can we reduce the number of cartridges? Um, on a site where there is a high loading, where we do actually design to, to a mass load, mm -hmm. absolutely, then we can reduce the um, the number of cartridges to handle the mass loads for the site. Mm -hmm. And that, that, I guess, answers from the first question that the GPT will definitely um, reduce the maintenance frequency of the storm filter. It makes it last a lot longer. Um, I guess the best um, cases where we do look at GPTs is on state highways, mm -hmm. where there is, um, we expect a lot of uh, higher um, sediment loading uh, sediment, uh, because of the high traffic situation. Um, and we've done in the past where we would increase the number of cartridges to actually handle the mass load and the mm -hmm. sediment, extra sediment loading coming in. Now, these days we actually use as a gross pollutant trap like the cascade or the vault capture to reduce that uh, sediment load. Mm -hmm. And now we can actually reduce the number of cartridges back to um, what it was. And we're actually still getting longer um, period before it actually needs to be maintained. But I think it's important though, Morel, that's if you, we have done a design for the storm filter based on the sediment mass load. Yes. It's not as if, say, you have a normal car park that needs five 69 centimetre storm filter cartridges. Putting in a litter trap will only make the maintenance better. It won't necessarily be able to reduce below the standard level of mm. the number of cartridges. But certainly where you've got these industrial sites, um, yes. it's 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 a very common thing for us to recommend pretreatment um, purely from a maintenance outcome perspective. Absolutely. And just remember as well, the storm filter has to be sized to its water quality flow first. Yeah. And then we can add extra to handle the mess load. But even if this site does have a small amount of um, sediment, Maybe for a storm filter that typically um, gets a maintenance every 18 to 24 months, mm -hmm. if we we'll put in a GPT, it probably can again extend it to three, even up to four or five years. Yep. 
like the case where it was installed with the soil. In that case, the prolonging of the maintenance frequency means, you know, the whole life cost may be reduced. Yeah. But some some really good questions there. Are there any other questions coming through? No, no questions from the floor. So Kevin, I, I have a question then. Um, what what in terms of um, common common issues that you come across with storm filter designs? What is the, one of the most common issues that you come across that that often needs to be uh, needs to be addressed? Um, there are a couple of things, I guess. One is um, from Chris's questions before. Sometimes the treatment system has to be installed, you know, upstream of a detention tank or a, um, a stream that that goes up and down with the tide. So what happens then it will have a tailwater effect mm -hmm. where we have to consider it, make sure that it doesn't affect the hydraulic of the system itself. And another thing that we looked at also is maintenance consideration mm -hmm. as well. Again, yeah. as getting access to the cartridge is definitely one of the big thing where we've had um, storm filter system gets and sort of run in the middle of the road, mm -hmm. where maintenance becomes a little bit of a headache because then we have to put in traffic management systems, yeah. PMPs, that makes the whole of life cost a lot more expensive. Yeah. Putting it to the side, you know, where it's easier to access, uh, that means you may not need TMPs and you provide a space for the sucker truck to park, things like that. Yeah. That reduces the whole life cost yeah. as well. Absolutely. Mm. Great. And um, Lee, we'll, um, we'll reach out offline and we'll be able to help you out with um, uh, with your system there. It indicates a price. Yes. <laughs> so uh, um, unless there's uh, any other questions. Oh, Chris. Chris has got a very interesting one. Is retrofitting to existing manholes a possibility? Ooh. Um, it is definitely a possibility, but it usually is quite, it is a little bit hard, I guess. Um, it does depend on the location of the manhole itself, how deep it is. And a lot of the time, the manhole might have a deep sump up to 500 to 1,000, yeah, a meter of um, sump. Mm -hmm. So it does make retrofitting quite a bit harder. Mm -hmm. And the cases where we did look at it, um, a lot of the time it actually ends up being more expensive than retrofitting an, a new manhole. Since to do that, we still have to rip up the road, we have to take out the concrete lid, things like that. So yep. it actually does end up being a lot uh, a lot more expensive in capital. One thing as well to bear in mind, Chris, is, is something that we, we, we briefly touched upon, but, but you know, didn't explicitly say is, mm. We designed the storm filters to have a flat floor. So uh, all of the manhole storm filters, they have a uh, an aluminium false floor of the entire diameter of the of the manhole that gets put in and installed and sealed while the before the storm filter goes in the ground and before the lid is in place. With the larger vaults, there is fluming that, and then there is a concrete false floor that is poured and the fluming is all installed again before the lid is put on. That's really important because it's really important to have a, an even flat floor uh, from a maintenance perspective. It's much easier to suck up uh, sediment and clean the sump if there is a flat floor rather than, um, rather than having pipes and flumes are going around that you need to get in and water blast around. So fitting that in for a device that's already a manhole that's already in the ground that may only have a, a 600 rather than 900 clear opening as well. Mm -hmm. it, it all adds to the cost and complexity. And it's something that because, again, we've done a lot of this work, um, we do really try and provide a, a good quality and consistency of, of the product. Um, so it's much easier often to get that quality by providing a, a new system. But it's um, we have done retrofits for sound filters. Yes, we have. Um, yeah. 
But again, the advantage of a sand filter is the um, footprint of a sand filter versus the footprint of a storm filter. The sand filter is that much larger. So there is a, a lot of spare space within that uh, structure to, to retrofit the storm to the retrofit country. into. Cool. Um, but it, again, Chris, we're in a fortunate position that um, A, we have a lot of experience and these are all custom designed and built in New Zealand. Um, so we can look at doing particular stuff for, for a particular job. So with that, we're, we've just reached the end of the end of our hour. Thank you all for joining us uh, for the lifting the hood on the storm filter. Uh, it's been an enlightening process for me to do a deep dive into a product which, um, you know, we think we know a lot about, but there's an awful lot more to it than 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 meets the eye. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And we will see you uh, next time for our next webinar. Thank you all.